I think it's actually really misogynistic that people can't take me on my own and evaluate my own opinions and instead they bring up Vosh and then they assume that I'm some sort of carbon copy of Vosh where as a woman I am not allowed to have any agency in this. I'm not allowed to have my own opinions. Apparently, I need to be in lockstep with Vosh, and that's not true. I disagree with Vosh on a lot of politics. We're not the same people. The first thing I want to go over is this Mary Sue article. Oh my god, there are people in the chat who have not heard about this article. So, found out about this article while I was still bedridden with COVID while I was on my trip to the US. And uh, as a result of all this, someone had to explain what Noodlegate is to Ro Khanna. So, my reputation really precedes me at this point. Yes, tipster, that, that's real. That's an actual thing. A congressman now knows about Noodlegate. So let's let's just go through this. Framing Keffels as the face of trans resistance has allowed her racism to stay unchallenged. A reign of terror. Just like starting this off, feel like this is incredibly melodramatic. But also, I am not the face of trans resistance. You know, I, I don't know where that narrative came from. And I don't like this consistent thing that happens where people build me up and place me into a role that I never claimed. And then they attack me from the position that they themselves put me in. But let's get into this article. In summer 2022, Twitch streamer Clara Sorrenti, aka Keffels, was featured on the Washington Post and other places as a doxing and swatting campaign coordinated against her on the anonymous form Kiwi Farms got increasingly dangerous. So the first thing that's interesting is that the link to the Washington Post article is literally the profile of me by Taylor Lorenz that happened months before any of the stuff with Kiwi Farms happened. It actually has nothing to do with any of the swatting, any of the doxing, any of the things that happened after it. The framing for this article is very disingenuous, but let's keep going into this. Bigot shared her home address and even a hotel she took shelter in. This backlash came because Sorrenti dedicated several hours a day to streaming commentary on anti-trans and LGBTQ plus laws and ratioing transphobes on Twitter. Ah uh, yes, great sourcing doing know your meme. The journalistic integrity is, is 10 out of 10. While many people aware of the situation gave sympathy to her, a small murmur of critics expressed frustration, often cryptically, that the violence towards Sorrenti positioned her as a martyr. They alleged that she frequently attacked POC in a way that fell just short of doxing. Sorrenti and her fans accused these critics of trying to sow distrust on behalf of Kiwi Farms. However, since then, she's been caught doing just that and a lot more. There is absolutely no citation in this entire paragraph. I have never attacked people of color in a way that fell just short of doxing. I've never doxed anyone before. I think it's also weird with the framing that me being the target of far-right attacks is somehow something that you can twist in a way to criticize me for. To continue on with this, Sorrenti's racism, especially towards Black and Asian people, ableism and even transphobia could fill a book. However, it's more useful to dive into just a few examples and show how she dual wields the language of social justice and the alt-right to cause harm on the very people she claims to be an advocate for, that the accusations of false flags trying to break solidarity between marginalized groups is nothing compared to her actions. Okay, wait. They're literally saying that my actions are worse than a far-right psyop against the entirety of the LGBTQ community. Not giving any citation on how that's the case. Meanwhile, Sorrenti masks her own bigotry under the guise of edgy humor for progressive causes and de-radicalizing the youth. And I, I had to pause for a sec because I also don't know where de-radicalizing the youth comes from. 
I, I don't think I've, I've never made content where I am explicitly saying I am trying to de-radicalize people. Uh, did they reach out to you for comments before publishing? No, they didn't. The best place to start is the recent harassment of writer and anti-rape activist Rosalind Tallison. So to the people who don't know, Rosalind Tallison is the lady who said, why did a white woman make a cookbook about dumplings and noodles and it is this noodle drama that has followed me for two entire years just continuously coming up over and over again so they're starting with rosalind tallis and not just because it shows a lot of the same patterns of behavior altogether but because this came after she got treatment for substance abuse in the spring of this year okay so they pulled up the My Struggle with Addiction video. I don't know what me seeking help for substance abuse issues has to do with any of this. It feels like this is just a way to discredit me because, well, a lot of people who call themselves progressives and say that they're on the left are very against ableism. They absolutely hate drug addicts. Like, they despise drug addicts, and for a lot of them, they feel like drug addicts are one of the groups that they're still allowed to be ableist against. After weeks of public hateful tirades on social media at the start of the year, Sorrenti pulled a Roseanne bar by claiming her behavior was the result of a cocaine addiction. I think it's a really weird comparison, but I actually want to see what... Okay, so they're saying that I blamed my behavior on cocaine addiction, and then they link a Sports Skeeta article, which basically claims that I stole $100,000 to buy cocaine, which is an insane claim. That is Pablo Escobar levels of cocaine. And I also think it's really weird that she's uh, citing a tabloid where the actual source for this rumor goes back to a chud logic clip so it's just like streamer drama and there's no actual source for any of this to go back to this article a few weeks after logging back online she came swinging with the same vile bigotry this time directed towards Talison. and we got this here popularizing racist dog whistles so the context here before I read any of these, I, I just want to give you all the context. I had just made a Blue Sky account and I was learning how to cook noodles. And I was ship posting on my Blue Sky account about noodles because I was having a good time making noodles. This wasn't directed at literally anyone. But let me just read you all this. I have gathered what I need. When I awake, it is time to make tasty noodles from the Why Did a White Woman Make a Cookbook About Dumplings and Noodles Cookbook. I will report on my findings. Noodles are tasty. Woman is a slur. It's transphobic to call it a period. It's a man -riot. Finally feeling up for cooking again after dealing with chronic health issues. So I hope you are ready for more noodle posting. Apparently, some people are mad at me for cooking noodles, but considering it was only in February I was cooking crack, I say this is a huge improvement. This is referring to the Blue Sky Global Block List. I was apparently number four yesterday, but if you believe statements like noodles are tasty as a racist dog whistle, or Keffels is racist because she added the Italian flag colors to the pride flag, you are brain dead and I don't want to interact with you. So it's just weird. Like, none of these are dog whistles. I'm literally shit posting about noodles while I'm learning how to cook noodles. So the article continues on. Tallison has been harassed over the years for a number of issues. However, the one Sorrenti decided to wade back into as part of her comeback to her from drug treatment is among the worst. It's very weird how they have to keep mentioning, by the way, Keffels went to rehab. Because they are absolutely trying to like elicit a reaction in the reader that, oh, Keffels is just a drug addict and drug addicts are evil. 
In 2021, Tallison made a passing comment on X, formerly Twitter, about a white chef's book about Asian cuisine. Paired with screenshots of the chef and her book, Tallison wrote, why did a white woman write a cookbook about dumplings and noodles? People who roll their eyes at the phrases cultural appropriation and systemic racism in publishing attack Tallison online. Unbeknownst to Tallison at the time, this included Sorrenti. Okay, wait. I have to stop for a second, and I need everyone to know that me attacking Rosalind online was literally a quote tweet that said, because dumplings and noodles are tasty. That was the beginning and the end of it. Tallison's tweets was passed around racist forums, and people made up lies about the author's background to prop up against Tallison's query. So, okay, this is actually true. There was a thing going around at the time that Pippa Middlehurst was adopted by Asian parents, and that's actually not true. I don't think that people needed to come up with that in order to justify her making this cookbook in the first place. She didn't do anything wrong. She just made a cookbook. People pried into Rosalind's personal life in a way not unlike many other writers of color have faced when expressing an opinion online that challenges white supremacy. In addition to making the book she criticized into a bestseller on Amazon, they used phrases relating to noodles as a dog whistle against her, like noodles are tasty. This allowed them to harass her in plain sight while seemingly making an innocuous, reasonable statement. So, noodles are tasty originally originates from me and they decided after the fact that it was a dog whistle and uh, now anyone who says it is doing a dog whistle when the only time this ever comes up it's to mock the fact that this drama has been going on longer than like any online drama I can think of in the last several years I don't think anyone is saying noodles are tasty as a way to disparage Asian people I have nothing but respect for Asian people and the Asian community. It is also interesting. So the racist forums, I decided to do my homework on this and Rosalind had a total of two 4chan threads about her that was about 80 comments total between both of them. And like a good third of that, at least, was anti-Semitism towards Pippa Middlehurst because the Nazis on 4chan were convinced that she was Jewish, and this is something that never gets talked about. Rosalind has managed to position herself as the sole victim of all of this. When Pippa was harassed so much, she ended up deleting her Twitter account and leaving the platform entirely. So going back to this, they use phrases relating to noodles as a dog whistle against her like noodles are tasty. This allowed them to harass her in plain sight while seemingly making an innocuous, reasonable statement. It's not unlike people commenting well, well, well under posts of people of color, religious minorities, and LGBTQ plus people participating in mundane activities linked to a stereotype. The article ended up including the banner for Catboy Ranch. This is just goofy. Don't get me wrong. Dog whistles are a real thing. If you are observant of people on the far right for any amount of time, you're very familiar with dog whistles. But this isn't a dog whistle. The point of people saying noodles are tasty is to laugh at a really benign online drama. It's not to disparage Asian people whatsoever. I have not actually engaged with Rosalind. We have not interfaced. I have not talked to her. The only time that I ever say her name is when people decide to resurrect the noodle drama again. A year later, Tallison saw that Sorrenti had joined the dogpiling with the new context of who she is. Tallison screen cap not tagging or quote tweeting Sorrenti's noodles tweet with the caption, quite interesting indeed. Sorrenti found this tweet in less than a day. Under the delusion that Tallison was looking for attention, Sorrenti decided to make Tallison's life a living hell once more. So this is me in a back and forth with Rosalind. She obviously has me blocked. You dug up a tweet that was over a year old only because I have a large platform now because you wanted to farm clout off of your shitty discourse brain takes. There were literally tens of thousands of people who weighed in on that discourse last year. The only reason she's going after me now is because my platform is 10 times larger and she can make people pay attention to her again by getting into a spat with me over it. 
And then I invited her onto my stream, which I'm still very much willing to talk to her if she ever wants to. People get this idea in their head that I just want to epically debate people, but I very much just want to understand where people are coming from and be able to have a dialogue. I kind of have stopped inviting people on when they have an issue with me because they react to the idea of talking to me on a public forum like I am setting them up and that this is going to lead to some sort of insane harassment campaign when I legitimately just want some dialogue on this topic. But yeah, I don't think that I made her life a living hell by engaging in online discourse. From June 2022 to now, Sorrenti posted a variation of that dog whistle dozens of times, not including times during live broadcasts. This includes reigniting and popularizing variations of the phrase on Twitter alternative Blue Sky. Her fans made graphics and emotes for her stream, making the racist harassment of Taliesin a community in-joke, just like the others who began this two years earlier. Some, like Sorrenti, are the same people. The noodle jokes aren't about her. Yeah, noodles are tasty is definitely a community in-joke in this community. Part of the reason that it's so funny is because people won't let this go. They're willing to write entire screeds trying to prove desperately that noodles are tasty is a dog whistle. Dog whistles are generally supposed to have some kind of subtle political message. I'd love to know what political message they think you're sending. I don't know. I have no idea exactly where they think the racism comes in with the phrase noodles are tasty. After years of people calling out Sorrenti's racism for referring to an Asian woman as noodles, I never did this. I have never referred to anyone as noodles before. Her friend and fellow white woman Brianna Wu used the past theory with Sorrenti. Wu claimed that it wasn't racist to call Taliesin noodles because her Asian husband said it was okay. This is Brianna Wu's husband. I asked Frank, and I have good news, Keffels. He says it's okay for white people to say noodles are tasty, since that includes spaghetti. You're free of this discourse. Like, nowhere in this tweet did it say that I called an Asian woman noodles. That's literally just noodles are tasty. This is also clearly a joke, not her giving you a pass. Yeah, everyone thinks that this discourse is really silly. But this amount of dishonesty is shocking to me. September 2023, Sorrenti would return the favor after leaked DMs show Wu's unfettered transphobia. That's the thing that I'm getting at after this, so I'm going to go past that. Because that's the next thing that I'm going to be talking about today. Because this was during the first wave of people leaving X, Sorrenti brought this with her to Blue Sky. At one point... She posted a variation of noodles are tasty a few times a day. This began in early July and continued through August, though her fans still do it. So we got the white leftist industrial complex video here, encouraging people to fake marginalization and weaponizing her own to shut down dissent. Well, Noodlegate was among the longest running of Sorrenti's extended racist campaigns, it's not the biggest this year. Her toxic behavior in the first half of Black History Month in the US and Canada tired out many trans creators trying to call her in. Sorrenti encouraged people to play Hogwarts Legacy. No, I didn't. This, this literally links to the Mary Sue tag for Hogwarts Legacy. This isn't a citation of anything that I said. I literally just said that I don't care if people play Hogwarts Legacy. And I stand by that. I think that it was actually a pretty bad boycott. There was a lot of ways that that could have been done. So among other reasons, the Hogwarts Legacy boycott's goal was to prevent gamers from financially benefiting well-documented transphobe and Harry Potter creator J.K. Rowling. The Canadian streamer repeatedly gave non-trans people a pass to play on the basis that she's transgender. Let's see, this is about Hassan? Um, I am not mentioned in the article. Maybe name? All right, let me, let me try that. Clara. No, my name is not mentioned in the article either. Apparently, I gave non-trans people a pass to play on the basis that I'm transgender, uh, which, as we've seen, there is no citation for this. Extending passes is a common Sorrenti deflection against criticism. 
Around this time, people asked her to stop saying the R slur, but Sorrenti claimed it was okay because she's autistic. The R slur thing goes to the Special Olympics website and is not actually a citation of anything that I have said. It's not a tweet. It's not anything from any of my streams. It has nothing to do with any of the arguments that are being made against me. So th this comes up and has come up in the past as well. And I think you can just say retarded. Like, I think if we're going to get to the point where we can't say that, we have to start cutting out other things in our vocabularies that basically mean the same thing. Like, how is calling someone stupid worse than that? How is someone, how is calling someone a moron worse than that? When they mean the same things in the context that they're used. I do think that Demon Mama made the best argument for it. You shouldn't let it be the go-to in your vocabulary because it's lazy. Like, I've definitely tried to cut back on saying it. There are a lot more creative ways to call someone stupid. Okay, so trans and autistic creator Jesse Earl as known as Jesse Gender, spoke out against Sorrenti for both undermining the boycott and being ableist. That never happened. A Jesse Gender never had a conversation with me about the Arsler. Sorrenti responded by implying that Earl was contributing to transphobia by focusing on Hogwarts legacy, that trans people complaining about the game were making trans people look irrational and like killjoys. This was not only victim blaming, see the link, this is not anything that I said. Again, I did not say any of this, and there's no citation for me saying any of this. This was not only victim blaming, but ignored the years of work Earl had done to dissect transphobic rhetoric and media with incredible patience, empathy, and humor. Sorrenti called her and others woke scolds and tender queers, synonymous with SJW and similar terms, both words are popular among the online alt-right. Tender queer is not a term popular among the alt-right. The term tender queer originates from online queer spaces. It came from queer people on Tumblr. I have, yeah, I've never heard anyone who is alt-right say the word tender queer. They just use slurs. Sorrenti encouraged viewers during a live stream to use diverse profile pictures to drown out criticism. So we got the infamous pick crew stream quote right here. The thing that drives me insane about this is that people have read into it what they want to read into it, where at the very end of this quote, it's someone asked me, does it matter which pick crew? And I say, no, just use a random one. But the more diverse, the better, like make it a black butch lesbian. I'm literally telling people to use a random one. And at multiple other points during that same stream, I said, here, use this random generator, hit the random button. Someone actually in that stream asked me, is this pick her too white? And I said, I don't care, use a random one. They always leave this part out because they're trying to build this narrative. Sorrenti would later claim this was caused by drugs and was being taken out of context. I said the more diverse the better and stumbled over my words trying to list off the different pit crews you can make because I was dangerously mixing drugs. I already admitted the pit crew thing was stupid, but how is 15 seconds of a two hour stream proof of your claim? I'm impressed at this point that an actual citation was used, but that said, let's just get back into it. This live stream has since been unlisted or deleted. When I watched the whole VOD months ago, it didn't make any difference. She still encouraged people to fake identities to undercut criticism against her. Also, this is on trend with her and others of the dirtbag left trivializing people who speak candidly from a place of marginalization as if that's wrong. The dirtbag left linked to um, a Gwen Snyder tweet about the 2016 election. Okay, birthers turned into MAGA. Breitbart turned into MAGA, Fox News turned into MAGA, 4chan alt-right, Gamergate alt-right, Gamergate dirtbag left, uh, alt-right turned into MAGA, 8chan Pizzagate, 4chan Pizzagate, MAGA pizza. What is- this is incoherent. But I don't think that I ever trivialize people who speak from a place of marginalization. I've always been pretty open to having conversations, even if they're uncomfortable ones. However, 
as I said, even in this stream, a lot of people don't actually want to have dialogue. And that's been this ongoing frustrating thing where they see dialogue as some form of harassment when I very much like to understand where people are coming from and how they arrive at the political positions that they're arriving at. This is the identical attitude of people who appropriated and lambast identity politics, just like the word woke. Using this to score social points shows a fundamental misunderstanding of how transphobia connects to other issues. Sorrenti fails to see how white supremacy is the root of transphobia, anti-blackness, queerphobia, etc. Or maybe she doesn't and thinks bigotry is fine if it's ironic. I'm asking this entirely in good faith because I've seen Rosalind make this um, statement before, but I do want to know why is white supremacy at the root of transphobia. I actually don't understand how that is connected. And I've never seen anyone elaborate on this point. I can understand making an argument that the tactics used in the current transphobia movement mirror the anti-black racism of the Jim Crow era, but I have no idea what the argument she would make here. I, yeah, I don't understand. As I, I would really like that to be elaborated on because I don't get how that's true. Okay, so now we're going into Vosh territory. Claiming one type of bigotry is okay to fight against another. A week later, Sorrenti showed lack of understanding again following the murder of Brianna J. Two teens were accused of stabbing the 16-year-old transgender girl in Britain on February 11th. Following J's death, Various press chose to dead name and misgender her. Between this and popularization of the hashtag in 2020, people began to speak about her under hashtag say her name and rest in power. After the 2015 so-called suicide of Sandra Bland, activists and the African American Policy Forum used the slogan to call attention to the murder of cis and trans black women, usually by police. Because this history is so public, Many pushed back against the adoption of this phrase for Brianna J, a white teen. With intersectionality, I feel like the logical conclusion is that you should be able to use this phrase for all marginalized groups. I think it's really weird that people got so hung up on a hashtag and tried to derail people who were rightfully very upset about the murder of a transgender teenager. The reason I got so upset about it is because it felt like people were coming at this tragedy with the most discourse brain imaginable. I get so upset even seeing that people only talk about Brianna J in relation to Twitter discourse. I feel like it's really dehumanizing. By February 12th, Dignity for Brianna took off as a more appropriate and specific marker to speak up about the transphobia Jay continued to face in death. Right on cue, Sorrenti defended the original hashtag usage by implying black people and transphobes were gatekeeping language. Her fans shared screenshots from a racist message board claiming the discourse was manufactured by trans transphobes to cause division. Be me, hear about the trans person who got stabbed, Rip Bozo. Get idea to make black people and trans people fight on Twitter. Log on to Twitter, post about how say her name is only for black people who got killed by cops. Bigger accounts take the bait on both sides. The only way this can get better is if Keffels, and I guess I got uh, dead named here, gets in on this. That wasn't my tweet and not an argument that I ever made. But they say, however, these images were dated five days after the discourse began on February 15th. That doesn't mean anything. You know, people could have not posted about it on 4chan and then later on admitted that they did that intentionally. But I do think that this actually points to the fact that so many people do not know how to actually have dialogue with each other, or people see conflict as inherently harassment and inherently abuse, when conflict is the focal point of politics. Like, you can't talk about politics without talking about conflict. And you need to be able to realize that you can have political disagreements without it being personal attacks on people. This is something that's been frustrating me to no end with progressive spaces where 
you cannot be in conflict with another person over political issues without people thinking that that conflict itself is a harassment campaign of some sort. This false flag claim was used to invalidate the thousands of people that real issue with the hashtag's misappropriation. It also fed into the tension between LGBTQ plus people and cis people of color highlighted and worsened by transphobes like Dave Chappelle. Am I being blamed for Dave Chappelle now? I didn't even instigate this. Comparing this messaging to her criticism of the Hogwarts legacy boycott, Sorrenti claimed that the focus should be on the material consequences of transphobia, true, like Jay's death, and not the language around it. Sorrenti used the same defense with her fellow edgelord leftist streamer Ian Kochinsky Vosh. Trans creators Cat Black and Natalie Wynn, as known as ContraPoints, called Kochinsky out when he used ironic tactical misogyny towards JK Rowling. That's not the definition at all. Is this what they mean when they talk about women being hysterical? That's not even the right tweet. Instead of recognizing how misogyny goes hand in hand with transphobia, and that this would feed into the myth that trans people and their supporters are inherently misogynistic, Kochinsky and Sorrenti claimed it was okay because Rowling deserves it. That's not how that works. Where is the citation? So the citation that I said that Rowling deserved it is a Jesse Gender video? With no timestamp either. Because I, I wasn't even a part of that drama cycle. I, I, I didn't weigh in at all about what happened there with Vosh and JK Rowling. I think it's actually really misogynistic that people can't take me on my own and evaluate my own opinions and instead they bring up Vosh and then they assume that I'm some sort of carbon copy of Vosh where as a woman I am not allowed to have any agency in this. I'm not allowed to have my own opinions Apparently, I need to be in lockstep with Vosh, and that's not true. I disagree with Vosh on a lot of politics. We're not the same people. You know, the thing that I do respect about Vosh quite a bit, though, is that when I have a disagreement with Vosh, I can talk to him about it. And I have, and I know that other political streamers in the space have had disagreements and went to Vosh, and they didn't immediately try to make it into content either because not every disagreement needs to be a public spectacle. The justification yet again fails to recognize how these systems of oppression intersect and come from the same root. This is why many have accused Sorrenti of continuing the long tradition of white feminism, albeit through an edgy, misogynist lens. I have never, I don't even think I've ever called myself a feminist before. Like, I'll be real. Like, it, it, if the people who wrote this article are feminists, then I'm not a feminist because I don't, I don't want my opinions to be like the type of opinions you get from this website. I'm not, I'm not against feminism either. I just think it's weird to say that I have positions that I don't. All right, we're, we're in the last section. Why it took so long for people to call Keffels out. There's several reasons it has taken people a long time to see the harm Sorrenti inflicts and the bigotry she fosters. Many took Sorrenti's word that the criticism came from transphobic forums. After all, the doxing Sorrenti faced was real and not an anomaly. Others like the edginess and see it as an acceptable coping mechanism against the bigotry she receives. Each time they choose to give Sorrenti the benefit of the doubt over mounting examples they choose to value her whiteness over the safety of marginalized people. Can we ever have this honest conversation about how much people inflate harm? What was the harm that I was doing? Where is this pain at scale and this um, immonstrable amount of harm that I have caused? Because I haven't seen it. They can't demonstrate the harm that I've done. They couldn't even in this article demonstrate exactly what I did. Yeah, like what Annie was saying earlier in this article, they said that my racism, ableism, and transphobia could fill a book, but then they said it's more useful to focus on individual examples, and then the example was noodles. I want to I want to address this sentence. This disappointingly includes important activists keeping up with anti-trans legislation like Aaron Reed and Alejandra Caraballo. 
So Aaron Reed and Alejandra, they're not my friends. We haven't talked to each other in quite some time. They distanced themselves from me around February uh, because of the mounting pressure to do so. And I don't blame them for that. I think that they're great activists. I think that they should do what they can in order to continue with their careers because they're doing great work to support the trans community in the United States and abroad. I really don't like that people are bringing them into this. There are a lot of people, content creators and activists, who personally don't have an issue with me. But because of all of the hit pieces that have gone out about me and the souring of public opinion about me, they don't feel that they can have any sort of public relationship with me. And that's fine. I think that there is a benefit actually to the position that I inhabit because I can be more edgy. I can say things sometimes that are a bit more off the cuff and a lot of people who are higher profile trans activists could not ever do that unless they want to receive the same treatment that I did. Even when people recognize Sorrenti's racism and misogyny, many still hesitate to call her out. Some see the trauma faced by marginalizing others as the price and process of de-radicalizing former incels. I have never done this. I, I don't de-radicalize incels. That's never been a thing I've ever done. I don't know where this is coming from. I've never done content on incels ever. It's not like she's the only person or even the worst to do this among her peers. Who are my peers? <laughs> the, the awkward Thanksgiving photo, yeah. We were all at the Progressive Victory event and we got a photo taken together, but Destiny and I aren't besties. Because we are all working together for progressive victory. But that never that doesn't mean that we've done content together or that I've de-radicalized incels. And this is just a weird argument to make. She's never had a Nick Fuentes on her broadcast multiple times. That's true. However, others don't feel like marginalized people should have to put up with 4chan humor, but do live in fear. I would really also like to know what they mean by 4chan humor. Is it that there are Pepe's in chat? Because then Hassan is also a 4chan humor streamer. Then literally every single Twitch streamer is part of 4chan humor. They don't want the attention of a community nearly indistinguishable from those thriving at the height of Gamergate. This is an insane thing to say because they acknowledge that I was the target of a harassment campaign from Kiwi Farms and a lot of the high profile people in that harassment campaign were people who were high profile during Gamergate. One of the biggest people who was harassing me last year was Mr. Medicur, who literally coined the term Gamergate. Where does this come from? Okay, so they included the, the Nazi phase comic. That's one thing that I found interesting about this article is that they just randomly throw in uh, little pieces of media that has nothing to do with the actual article. Nazi phase by Nash Romy. I'm glad I cracked my egg or I would have been a white supremacist by now. I would have been so racist to you. I have never been on the right in my entire life, ever. I, I was always either a communist or a social democrat. I have always been like somewhere in between a social democrat and a communist. Like, basically, since I was 14. So I don't understand. I feel like this is a trope that constantly gets weaponized against trans women, like white trans women. Uh, this idea that white trans women, for some reason, are more predisposed towards being members of the alt-right and uh, white supremacists when that's not true. A lot of the times, people do this intentionally in order to feel justified in attacking white trans people because they know that they're a part of a marginalized group uh so they have to focus on the fact that they're white in order to get like a really good uh woke scold critique in a few people have spent time explaining how sorrenti and her peers uphold white supremacy while claiming to fight it people like Talison, jesse gender soul bunny foreign man in a foreign land and others so it's all people that have 
lied about me and tried to drag my reputation through the mud. In each of those cases, they've faced harassment and content farming from Sorrenti and others. She uses the same tactics mentioned above and more, while feigning playing defense. So that's interesting because Foreign made a video about me unprovoked, Soul Bunny made two videos about me unprovoked, Jesse Gender, our falling out started because she boosted a video attacking me made by FD Signifier and then has since promoted more and even collaborated in other videos attacking me. And Talison started attacking me before I even knew who she was. These are also bigger content creators than me. Foreign is bigger than me. Jesse is bigger than me. A single tweeter video results in hours of videos and streams. Fans flood their communities demanding you to debate their fave. They want to see the spectacle and performance of watching their fave destroy someone with facts and logic like they used to with the Daily Wire hosts. And that's where the article ends. The article ends with me getting compared to a Daily Wire host. It really disappoints me how much wanting to have open dialogue with people is seen as wanting to epically own them with facts and logic and destroy them. I would love to have conversations that are difficult to have with people who absolutely despise me. I think that would be really interesting. More than anything, I want to build bridges. I want to be able to work with people even when people have disagreements with me. Like, this isn't something that a lot of people who consider themselves progressives or leftists think is acceptable. They want to frame everyone who they agree with on probably 99% of issues as some sort of villain and just completely demonize them. This isn't disagreement, this is demonization. I mean, yeah, this is a hit piece. There's so much intellectual dishonesty in this entire article, and the timing of this is no coincidence. Like, this article came out right after I ended up appearing in the Washington Post because I was going to be talking to Ro Khanna alongside uh, Vosh and Destiny and Emma Vigiland, but I got COVID. And people saw that there was an uptick in me getting mentioned in the mainstream media again. And they're like, all right, what can we do to drag her name through the mud? It's also pretty rare to see these people use their articles to move people towards political action. Yeah, I mean, what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is literally just that I suck. It should have a conclusion. I feel like I would even respect it a bit if the conclusion was how to advance any sort of political cause instead of just being a hater. I'm gonna have opinions that people in my own audience don't agree with too. I accept that. All of the stuff that happened, which I'm gonna get into, like the stuff with Brianna Wu and the group chat link leak and everything, people in Catboy Ranch were pretty heated. But if there's anything that I respect about this community, it's that people were willing to actually push back and have a dialogue about it. I actually really like that. That's a great thing. You, you should be able to have a disagreement with someone. I'm not going around like purging the community of people that disagree with me. I think it goes to show it's actually way more productive to just talk about this stuff than to blast each other on social media forever. I mean, yeah, there's a reason why I've cut back like quite significantly on my social media presence. Social media, um, especially Twitter, it boosts outrage and it fuels division that doesn't need to happen.